Hey everyone, um, first we might have some overlap with Patrick, uh, we did not <laughs> build together the presentation but it's a slight one, uh, so uh, I'm going to try to go fast on the slides, um, really happy to be here, uh, I'm going to start uh, quickly about myself and then we will talk about how to track investment in open source companies. <laughs> So I'm Max, uh, I'm an engineer by graduation, built two companies in the past. Uh, first one was a consulting company, still exists, a few hundred people, um, and I thought I would build a product company uh, that would scale better. Uh, actually, somehow failed at it, uh, spent four years building it, went through Y Combinator, which is a US-based accelerator. Um, we are building an automation tool for developers to chain APIs really easily, a bit like Zapier, I don't know if you heard about Zapier, but for developers. And interestingly enough, uh, I think we talked to close to 100 VCs and nobody gave us money. Angels were giving us money. Yeah, sure, sure. Can you hear me now? It seems it's wonderful. Hello? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we talked to 100 VC firms and nobody gave us money while angels were giving us money. And it took us four years, but we realized that VCs were right because we just failed at building the company. So I thought maybe I would try to go on the VC side to understand how those guys could see the future, right? Because I was so convinced of what we were building still did not manage building a big company about it. Um, fun fact is that I would not invest in this company I built four years ago <laughs> today. Um, what I'm doing now, I'm working at Runa. Uh, Runa Capital, Dimitri is here too. Um, it's a 10 more years old fund. We've been investing from 1 to 10 million, mostly around Series A, but I'm investing also a bit earlier, so proceed seed. Um, we have more than 100 startups. Uh, we have invested in more than 100 startups. Uh, I've still a lot of dozens uh, in portfolio and deployed more than 500 million uh, during the last 10 years. And we do so on specific verticals, so we don't do everything. Uh, and I think somehow by, you know, our DNA we have uh, somehow a geek team, so we like geek thematics. Um, so we do this on open source and dev tool, which is what I cover with Dimitri and Constantine, who is not here today. Uh, and one of our brilliant portfolio <coughs> companies is actually MariaDB. Um, we do this on future of computing, uh, so everything related to quantum computing, photonics, edge computing, so more on the hardware side, but still uh, the hardware that will power data processing and computing for tomorrow. Um, another thematic is enter enterprise AI, so how do you automate or help large companies do better their job using AI? And the last one is fintech infrastructure. And why I'm here? Because we do love open source. Uh, I think one of the very first deals that the fund did uh, back in the 2012 uh, is NGNX actually. Um, then, of course, MariaDB, a bunch of other cool projects. Uh, I don't know if you know all of them. If you don't know them, uh, you should definitely check them out. Uh, there is some infra tool, monitoring, Gen AI, and uh, some other categories that are starting to be eaten by open source. And this is where maybe my point of view would slightly differ from Patrick's one around the infrastructure. I think open source is growing very strong in other areas than just infrastructure. Uh, again, we'll look back on the team and what requires to build successful companies in this area. So maybe before talking about investing, uh, why should we, you know, bother or why open source matters? And actually, a really interesting fact, um, I, I learned about this Two months ago, so I was in San Francisco for a summit around open source, and one of the co-founders of Red Hat was explaining that everything started with open source. For me, you know, open source was the cathedral in the bazaar, and from now on, you know, we are talking about open source, but that's not the case. 
And back in the 50s, if you were buying this really nice computer that would fill, I think, half of this room, probably, and that is way less powerful than your phone, the operating system was open and actually free. But that's another point. Um, and and I, I think it's really interesting to get in mind that until the 60s, everything was open. And IBM came with this, this idea of, okay, I'm doing open software, maybe I should distribute binaries and not source code, because I could also make money off updates, which is a business decision, right? Um, another point why open, why open source matters is because it's very powerful. If you think about it, it's powered by the community. And last year, more than 300 million of contributions have been made on GitHub on open source projects. It's a lot of contributions. And things are growing. Uh, it's very transparent. I, I love to use the Windows emoji for the transparency. Um, and, and we talked a bit about locking. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for following all the questions around locking. <laughs> Uh, but you, you don't create commercial locking. Uh, you might create some technical dependencies, but then you know if you don't want to pay anymore, you can still use the community edition of that service with all the bonds, but still you can keep using the service. And those those um, strong arguments makes open source foundation of the tech sector as a whole. With the good and the bad, right? I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this man, uh, but it's basically all our modern infrastructure. And you see this little thing here is a repository maintained by a guy in Nebraska, which is a total random. And if he starts, you know, if he stops maintaining or like includes a vulnerability, you can just break out a big piece of infrastructure. Um, last but not least, open source is everywhere. Like 98% of all code bases are using open source from Osra, and they made this survey a few years ago. Um, and Red Hat found out why, and there is a lot of arguments in favor of open source, but generally, software is higher quality, um, it's more innovative, uh, you have a better security because, of course, a lot of people are contributing. This is true, of course, for the large repositories, right? Uh, and, and your ability to like leverage open source internally uh, and build around easier than you know, with closed source uh, software. Small word about commercial open source. Um, and maybe start with a look back at history. So if we look before the 90s, it was almost gross to ask how much open source would cost. And then in the 90s, some companies started to to charge for support and professional services. Uh, I will go quite fast on this one because Patrick covered it. Um, but then, from the 90s, we figured out that professional services could not scale as well as you can scale a product, right? I built a consulting company, I can tell you that it's way harder to hire 10 consultants than to build a cluster with 10 nodes. And then, you know, from there we thought about building products, and there is mostly two ways of monetizing open source projects. The first one is open core. So you build the core of the, the, the tool, of the software, and then you will sell enterprise features like SSO, which is around authentication, airbag, which is role-based <coughs> access control, so who can access what and do what, you can call it permission also, uh, audit, security, and so on and so forth. And then you end up having a small piece of your users that turns customers and pay for everyone, right? Um, and then another way, and maybe the most recent one that I've been told um, a lot about, is the SaaS uh, approach. And what's interesting is that we see that the open core companies are moving to SaaS, and the SaaS companies are also offering open core. Um, maybe the learning here is what makes open source different is that if you want to create a community, and if you want to bring value to your community, the core of your software needs to be the open part. Because otherwise, it doesn't matter. People don't get value from it. And then you will charge around it, being support, being enterprise features, or hosting. Now, this is a slightly provocative slide, but like I was thinking yesterday how I could 
token illustrates pricing uh, in open source. And I went on, I went on Mungo's um, site. And actually, like, there is no difference with any closed source company if you look at this page. You have this demoniac stuff for free thing, but you try to convince yourself that you will never pay. But from the moment you click, you, you are condemned to pay a few hundreds of bucks per month in the near future. And then you will move to this SaaS offering, right? Which is no different with any closed source company. And if you have a slightly larger, or if you draw, then you will need to talk to people. But this talk to us is the worst thing ever, because you know that from the moment you will tell about your size, then you will define the price you will pay, right? Um, this one I can go quite quick on this because I'm sure you are very familiar with it. Uh, but the database is, is a really great example of how open source wins. And it's still somehow the beginning, because if you look at GenAI and vector databases, uh, we'll talk about it here tomorrow, but even the new entrants, Main part of them are open source. Pinecone is maybe the only important one which is closed source, but then you have like dozens of them being like Quadrant, Chrome OS, and so on and so forth, being open source and, and, and taking a lot of market chance. Now you're a bit conflicting probably popularity with the revenue because the, big re the revenue is on the red line and increasing. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, I think that they are stable. But I look at all of that because they were pretty stable. So they may just increase prices, but they get less users. Yep, uh, they have churn and then they increase for those green. Yeah. <laughs> Why now is a good moment to invest in open source? I would say there is um, two strong reasons. Um, the environment is more open source friendly than ever. So if you, like, if you look at those four stakeholders, Developers are more powerful than ever, and they are growing population. So we, we did a forex in terms of developers on GitHub uh, in the last five to six years. Um, enterprise are conscious of the advantages of using open source and are more open to, to, to use commercial open source um, software. Government are pushing for compliance and regulation and are also trying to advantage open source companies. If you look at the AI, European AI Act, there is a piece of it which is still not very clear, but should give stronger uh, advantage for open source companies rather than closed source ones. And last but not least, investors are more conscious of the fact that you can build successful companies being open source. And I like to illustrate it with the, those, those I, I call them the seven dwarfs. Uh, which those seven companies represent more than 100 billion valuation. And it's just seven companies. Okay, they might be the, the biggest one in open source, but it's still, you know, meaningful. And I think the last argument is that everybody loves open source. <laughs> I mean, I mean, sorry, everybody loves yeah. open source. Um, and, and, and things are changing, right? Uh, and, and being because they really love them or they don't have choice, everybody loves open source. Uh, maybe a quick point on how do we approach investing in, in commercial open source companies. Um, so first, the most imp an important point is that the fundamentals are the same. Um, you want a strong team, but then maybe slightly different because you need like technical, really strong team, but not only, right? Because if you put just engineers, then you might struggle on monetization. But if you put only business people, then you might be ridiculous talking to developers about why your product is, is better than any other competition, competitor. Sorry. Um, and something that I'm really looking forward to is, is, is for design in open source. Uh, we have a new wave of companies that are really focused on offering beautiful tools and delightful, which has been lacking in the open source area for years. And I strongly believe that combining delightful tools and open source tech is a really strong way to, to build successful businesses. Um, of course, I don't like so much the, the, the word vision, because I think the best vision is just do what your users want you to do. Um, but still, you know, uh, 
when someone comes to you and explains you why it would make sense to build an open source CRM, and you never thought about it, uh, there is some kind of vision here, right? The go-to-market is super important, because you don't go top-down to sell to developers. I don't know if you guys already tried to outreach a developer trying to sell him something, but it's the best way. In the best case, to not have an answer, in the worst case, to, to get some bad words. Um, the ambition, the market, how big it can get, I, I will not make a list, but fundamentals are the same. Then, you can have a slightly different approach. Um, and we do this approaching things in two different ways, depending on the company. We can go from traction to thesis, so we ingest a lot of data uh, from GitHub mostly, and check what repositories are growing, and what repositories are owned by companies. And when we saw something, when we see something that is growing and that makes sense, then we transform the traction into a thesis on why do we think that this company might win something uh, on, on, on in this segment. It's the case with a company we invested last year called Panda CI. Um, I tried to show when we invested to someone here. Um, it was really hard to follow because it was just a lot of traction. Um, I just woke up one day and I saw this panda everywhere around me, like uh, on the web. It seems like a, you know, I had some bug around me. Just the guy gets super viral, a really good founder with this vision of running Gen AI on premises for enterprise uh, to deal with data. Um, so we made the deal. You can approach things differently from thesis to traction, which is analyzing successes from the past. For instance, Odoo. I don't know if you guys know this company. It's a local company, they are Belgians. Uh, it's an open source ERP. Who the hell, 10 years ago, would think that an open source ERP would worth billions? And they are winning because they built such an ecosystem that they have way more integration and connections than any other competitor. And by you know engaging their community, they created what we call bottom up verticalization, where some customers or users are building plugins. For instance, in the plumbing industry, some large plumbing companies have like developers, mostly you know, doing the website in JavaScript. Those guys build some modules around Odoo, which is the, one of the only ERP in JavaScript, which Odoo resold to all the plumbers around the world. I don't know any other ERP that would ship a feature for plumbers. Because actually, Odoo did not cheat it. Just reuse something that a user, the customer did, and won a small niche through this plugin. And niche by niche, they built hundreds of millions of revenues and billion dollar valuation. And from this thesis, we started to look around how we could apply it to different approach. And this is the last deal we did in, in open source that is not public yet, uh, but it. That is a commercial open source CRM. Why CRM? Because you know, similarly to ERP, the ecosystem matters a lot, and the, probably the only way to go to fight with Salesforce and HubSpot on ecosystem is by an, an open source and a community popular approach. Um, a quick word about GitHub. Why GitHub matters? Because you can have a sense of how efficient is the go to market and how efficient is the parent. If the go-to-market is efficient, then you should have the target audience coming to the repository. And then, if the R&D is efficient, then this target audience should leave a star, should open an issue, contribute, fork, even better, add a dependency to the repository and use it um, for that for tool. Um, around traction, um, uh, happy to enter in details uh, in, 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 in later discussions, but we look a lot about traction, different things. Uh, obviously, dependencies are more important than stars. Star is still um, an interesting one to understand, you know, how many people find this interesting just having a good look at it. Obviously, Hacker News uh, is a really good test also, and when we want to have an idea of you know, how given population, especially technical population, react to, to a repository, that's the best place to go. Um, Community also, uh, you can have a look to the community using GitHub data, everything is open. Um, this is, by the way, a curve that you might uh, know. 
And and yeah, like things that we are looking is where are located the contributors? Are those guys organic contributors or just friend and family guys? For instance, you know, YC companies generally tend to have like a lot of contributors for a one or two months old project because basically if you check a bit, it's a lot of batch mates. Um, still, you know, starting things, right? Um, Discord and Slack dynamics are super interesting. Contribution dynamics, like, you know, a lot of issues. Uh, if people, when they, when they push a PR, is it like just correcting a typo? Is it a bug fix? Is it like a feature? So those things are different level of content right? And of course, yeah. we built automation for yeah, yeah, so, so but this, those curve are extract of our uh, database. We have a yeah. few terabytes uh, of, of GitHub data. Uh, I'm happy to show you a bit. Uh, it's like, it's like, you're happy to share? Or? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, joking. Uh, 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 well, uh, uh, quite open. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's actually a site for the OSS inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah which is nice. Uh, we, we have a little pet project internally. Uh, we would try to turn it uh, conversational. So we are exploring, uh, you know, especially we are. Uh, Company doing this, uh, so maybe uh, soon you can uh, just ask a question. And I think an important point is also what kind of unfair advantage can you build around open source? Like some founders sometimes are asking Max, like, my company is closed source, but if I open source, would you open? Would you invest in it? And you know, I I totally agree with Patrick. That's not the way it works. Generally, you go open source because you have strong conviction that this is what will make you win. And some of the reasons can be the role of the community being to build integrations or, for instance, power security like ProSec is doing. Um, if you want to sell to regulated industries and everybody is providing SaaS, then going open core might be an excellent idea and it might be an unfair advantage related to competition. The way you target your users and who are you targeting to create an, organ an organic traction, uh, this might be also an unfair advantage. The security and, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of ways of doing open source that might turn into a strong advantage uh, related to competition. That's about it. Uh, I'm just finishing quickly about some process related things that we, we do at Runa. So we have this uh, awesome list of open source alternatives that is here for, for, for a while. Uh, there is a bunch of, of companies, open source companies is still there. Um, feel free to add some if you have your own company or if you, you know alternatives to closed source uh, solutions. We also do the Ross Index, which is like a quarterly uh, ranking of open source companies that have the strongest growth, it's stars related, so it's not the best way uh, you know, to analyze growth, but still an interesting one. And this is the companies from Q4 23. Uh, it's all public, you can find it on, on our website. And uh, my favorite activity is the open source beers. Um, and the four beers, right? Uh, which we organize we did it in Paris, uh, we did it in London. We're going to do it in Brussels soon, hopefully in Germany. Uh, if there is any location you think we should come, uh, please let me know. That's it, guys. <laughs>